Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Masters of Marketing. Today, we're going to be talking with the digital, the director of digital strategy for top rank marketing, Ashley Zekman, who's going to be teaching us how to use influencer marketing as a B2B company to make up for all of the lost exposure from the cancellations of conferences and all of your digital online events. Ashley, great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So um, Gary Vee says that you should use micro influencers. Big influencers are expensive. I would love to hear what your take on all of that is. I'm just going to let you dive into your presentation and I'll follow up with a bunch of questions. Okay. Well, I have an answer to that one that's top of mind. So whew, amazing. threw me a softball to begin with. All right. Give me just one second. I do have a few slides. I promise to try and talk fast so that everyone can get their questions answered. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So, um, like you mentioned, we're going to be talking about, you know, how to really partner with B2B influencers in a way that builds authenticity and trust in what is totally an unpredictable world at this point, right? Um, events are being canceled. Uh, so that kind of one to one exposure to your audience and that ability to connect with them has been uh, You know, it's taken a bit of a nosedive, right? So uh, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Um, first off, just real quick. Um, this is my team, um, we do B2B influencer marketing for um, enterprise and mid-sized tech. Um, and many of these you'll see we are um, currently running programs for them, some ongoing, some more short term, uh, but enough of that. Now for the good stuff. So we know that people don't trust our content, right? Even before all of this was happening, when people weren't distracted, there wasn't a pandemic, there wasn't rioting happening around the world, uh, people were already losing trust in brands. Um, but 68% of them say that trust in a brand influences their purchasing. So how can you build that trust a little bit more effectively? Um, one way is with influencers. So we know that 68% of people prefer um, credible content from industry influencers, but only 24% of them are partnering with others to expand, oh, I have a typo there, others to expand their reach. Um, so we know that people trust uh, influencers, but we also know that not many brands are partnering with them, which means there's still a lot of room uh, for companies to start dipping their toe in the water. So what we see as a bit of a formula for success when it comes to partnering with B2B influencers is, are they topically aligned? So are they talking about the things that your brand wants to be known for? Are they credible? And the output, what is the output, right? Some killer content, some, something that's not boring, something that they can't get anywhere else. Um, and that's what we think builds that authenticity and trust. Um, so I just wanted to tell a semi-quick story about one of our clients, LinkedIn. Um, so we do uh, B2B influencer marketing for LinkedIn marketing and LinkedIn sales, um, a lot of which we do on LinkedIn, which I know is so meta. <laughs> um, but what we're really trying to accomplish with this program is to connect with those hard to reach buyers um, by partnering with these industry experts to create a more authentic content experience. So I just wanna run through a little bit what this looks like, what to do, what not to do, um, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so the first debate is always, should we do campaigns? Should we do always on? And I think especially given our current circumstances, people don't have three months to put together a giant campaign. There's just, there's no room for it, right? There's so many things that are unpredictable. Um, marketing budgets are being cr cut across the board. Um, so you don't really have that luxury to plan um, it, as far ahead as you used to. Um, and one of the things when it comes to working with influencers as well is this is an example uh, pulled from one of our tools tracker of a client that only does campaigns. Um, and what this is meant to indicate is the total number of brand mentions by our group of influencers we're working with. So you'll see you get some spikes and then it flatlines, right? That's what happens when you don't have an ongoing program. Um, this, however, is an example of our program with LinkedIn uh, that we've been running for about, let's see, two years next month, um, full, full steam ahead all the time. Um, and of course, we've had to definitely change our tactics. Um, and you'll notice that there are some drops in the last couple of months, um, but um, the client has really wanted to kind of pause on publishing a little bit. Um, so we aren't engaging as much as we normally would, but you'll see that there's all of these different spikes, um, never a flat line as a result of this. So here's just kind of a, a brief map of our approach. Again, this is a more mature influencer marketing program because we are two years in. Uh, we have about 75 sales and marketing experts that we're partnering with currently. Uh, we engage them on social media. We create content to honor them. Um, that's really focused on not asking something of them, but finding a way to showcase them and their expertise. 
Uh, we do have more long form content and, and interviews and ebooks and things like that that we've done. Uh, but we've also uh, recently started dipping our toe in what we're calling a long form social first campaign um, on LinkedIn. And I do have um, a couple examples of that. Um, another thing that I definitely want to call out is that we've really, really tried um, from the beginning to build a foundation based on diversity and inclusion, right? So we want to make sure that we're capturing all of the voices in the industry. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at too, uh, like you had asked at the beginning, are, are what are the different types of influencers that we're working with? And we have five main types. So we're not just going after, you know, the people with extensive reach, uh, which we call brand individuals, uh, but we're also going after niche experts, right? So who are the people that can provide really deep uh, expertise on very specific topics? Who are the up and comers? Um, who are some internal um, stakeholders that are looking to build their own thought leadership at the brand? And then prospects and customers um, are great partners for helping your audience see themselves in the content that you're creating. Um, so again, just, you know, really want to make sure that people feel equally represented um, as a part of this group and the different things that we do with them. Um, and one of the things that we look at initially, and this hasn't changed at all, um, you know, kind of given current situation, is finding that right mix of, you know, what are the topics that we want to be talking about? Um, where is their search demand? And where can we find influencers with that expertise? So that's kind of what we call the influencer marketing sweet spot is where those three things overlap. Um, and then we go about um, mapping people that have, uh, you know, that are known for those topics, but also are credible um, and uh, really kind of fit what we're trying to connect with the audience on. And like I mentioned, we currently have about 75 influencers that are aligned on all points that we're engaging in a variety of ways. Um, one of the things we also like to look at are what are the qualities? So, or, and this is an example of um, for our program for LinkedIn as well. They really wanted people with real life experience. So they didn't want people um, who were running around saying, I'm, I'm an influencer, I'm an influencer, I have a big social media following. They wanted people who'd actually been in those positions before. Um, they wanted people that were down to earth, uh, people that were good on camera, especially, you know, with the launch of LinkedIn Live. Um, so again, kind of really knowing what you where that alignment is with your brand and the influencers you're working with is super important. Um, and here are just a few examples of some engagements. So uh, we are utilizing LinkedIn social networks um, to connect with the influencers, share their content, comment on them. That's the example I have here at the left. Um, in the middle is an example of a um, holiday reads program that we did just this last winter. Um, Though the results of that, we were around between 940 and 2,000% above our comments benchmark. So people were engaging with it heavily in platform. Um, and then again, an example of what I talked about that honoring content. Um, again, we're not asking people to create anything, but um, alone from this one piece, we had over 4.5 million impressions from influencer shares alone. So this wasn't even something they contributed to, it was just something, uh, a way for us to feature them. Um, and then generating ROI. So again, we are partnering with these influencers to create blog content. Um, and then as I'd mentioned before, this social first program. So we went after uh, 15 sales and marketing influencers and asked them what we thought were more interesting questions than your average what is one marketing tip you can give people? Um, this is really focused on, you know, what is one thing you wish you would have known at the start of your career? Um, what was one life-changing moment? What's something not on your LinkedIn profile people should know about you? And also, who is someone that you like, who you see as a rising star that you really like to shine a light on? So again, you know, we are finding that these uh, social first programs, uh, this was the first one that we'd ever done, and we've now extended it to, I think, seven or eight other clients. Um, and we found that in current times, uh, finding a way to engage in platform, not trying to guide to another piece of content, has been a really great way to connect uh, with the influencers, with the brand, um, and then with your audience on those social profiles. And like, like I promised, I talked really fast. I think I'm just at about eight minutes. Whew. Um, so again, I know that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Um, but what I guess I really want to key in on is, you know, that importance of building uh, long lasting relationships with people that are aligned with your brand, that are saying the same thing, um, that are credible to your audience as a way to really reach those people, um, that you're, you know, trying to get in front of in a time where we don't have in-person events. Um, people are getting Zoom fatigue, they're tired of being on meetings. Um, and communication, you just have to be really careful about your communication, right? So um, I just think this is a really good opportunity, especially now, uh, to add that needed credibility. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, here's my contact information. 
I also want to let you know that we are coming out with the first uh, B2B influencer marketing report later this summer. Uh, it's something that my team and I have been working on. Um, so excited to share that with you all. Ashley, that was great. That was a great <laughs> example to walk through lots of influencers. Yes, very, very fast. Let's talk even faster now. Okay, um, there's so many questions to dive into. We have some coming in starting right at the very beginning of your presentation, actually how you ended your presentation with that B2B influencer report. Um, the question that I have is, what questions are you answering in that report that um, maybe you don't already know the answers to, but the report will help answer to help your clients and other people decide what to do with influencers? Yeah, what we're really looking at is what makes a successful B2B influencer marketing program, right? So a lot of the people that, well, all of the people surveyed are actually implementing B2B influencer marketing in some fashion. So we're trying to get to the bottom of, you know, what works, what doesn't, um, what a good investment looks like, what a good program structure looks like, um, and kind of, you know, why building for the long term is so important. Um, so we're kind of looking at, you know, the current state um, and trends and things that the most successful B2B influencer marketing teams are doing. And then what is the future hold? You know, what is kind of that next evolution um, in, a, in a somewhat new um, sort of industry, right? Gotcha. As I know you, you said that you should use the always on versus the campaign. Do you have any specific hypotheses of like things that you think are true, but from that report, you, you really don't know that you specifically want to answer? <sighs> yeah, I think... Um, it's the, the funny thing is, you know, sometimes the people that have been running their programs the longest aren't necessarily the most successful. And just because they're doing always on doesn't mean that they're always having more success than those doing campaigns. Um, but which I know sounds like a uh, <laughs> like I was talking in circles. But what I really mean by that is it really what really matters is how you do it, not just the tactics that you're implementing. And I think, you know, being thoughtful, forming relationships. Um, is, is something that we um, have been doing for a long time. We also found that a lot of people um, who answer the report are paying a lot uh, in influencer marketing and 90, about 90% 90 of our engagements are unpaid. Um, that means we've been spending decades building relationships with people that um, our clients get to benefit from um, and we're still building new ones, right? Um, and that's not to say we wouldn't pay someone if the ask called for it, but our influencers uh, trust us to partner them with brands that will add credibility to what they do as well. And I know that wasn't a question, but I figured I'd throw that in there. <laughs> that is good. It, it leads kind of into my next question, which I had on the list of, when you say you partner with influencers rather than pay them, they want credibility. What are the other top things that they want that maybe you're small, maybe you're like a startup with a couple people, you can just start building those same relationships. Um, what do you provide a value that maybe as one person you can provide a value to someone that you're just trying to build a relationship with? Um, so are you asking if you're a small brand um, and not necessarily one of those? So I kind of actually have two questions. Okay. One is you talked about LinkedIn and LinkedIn's a huge company so they can pay for a large in, uh, influencer campaign. So if you're a small company, maybe you just want one influencer. So how would you recommend that they work with you or some, someone else to uh, do a small campaign with one influencer? Um, and then just even simpler than that, uh, like I, I interact with people on LinkedIn all the time and I'm just building relationships with them. Um, I know that they might last for decades. Is there ways that people can just, uh, do you have any tips for how they can start building the relationships that you have, not to undermine your business, yeah, no, so that no. they can have good relationships with people for decades? Um, okay, so, so first question, I wouldn't typically recommend you just work with one person, um, one influencer, because I think you need some diversity in terms of different, different influencers provide different expertise, different things. And let's say you create, um, you just want to do a blog post where you get insights from five different people. So if you just got insights from one person, that's only one extra person that's amplifying it. If you get insights from five people, then that's five people. Um, and I think the key is to make it really easy for them uh, to contribute. Um, so yes, even if you are a small brand, um, show them show them value in some way um, by, you know, again, sharing their content, doing things that they see as positive signals that you're sending out to them before you ask anything of them. Um, and then your second question, which has already escaped my mind. It's, it's just the basic, how do you make good oh, okay. relationships with people? Yeah, I mean, um, 
I think authenticity is key. So again, that nur like that nurturing where you are sharing their content, where you're interacting with them online, um, and then being really thoughtful when you reach out to them and personalizing it. So we don't have like a template of like insert here, insert here, insert here. Um, all of our outreach to individuals we want to partner with as influencers is very, very customized. Um, so that means you have to be paying attention uh, to what they're saying um, as a means to start building that relationship. And our clients get a lot of benefit from the fact that we've been building these relationships for 10 years. So even if you are a small startup, as long as you're doing something pretty cool, um, we can get help get bigger voices with bigger reach than you might be able to get on your own. Gotcha. Have you heard of Gary Vee's $1.60 method? Is it for every $1.60 you spend in influencer marketing, you get no. extra return? No. Okay, no. then I have it. It's just, you should put your two cents on 80 different posts every single day. Mm -hmm. And it'll cost you $1.60. It'll actually cost you a lot more than that with your time. Um, my question is, do you use that with influencers where they post on a lot of different stuff? Or do you reserve how much they post on to make their individual posts deeper and um, I don't know, just more thoughtful? I think thoughtful is what we're going for. Um, so quality, not quantity, I guess. Um, and you know, our, we don't, to, especially if we're not paying influencers, we don't say you need to promote this thing five times or you need to do this. It really is us making it easy for them. So we'll pre-write social messages for them if they've contributed to something give them social images, give them track links, give them everything that they need um, to make it easy. Um, but again, it really is, it is based on trust, right? So we aren't contractually saying do 12 things. We're saying, could you do a couple things, right? Um, and then measuring the impact of that. I don't yeah. know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, no, it does. It answers it. Um, we have a question from the Q&A. One sec. Do you track ROI and how do you track ROI for influencer campaigns? What are some of the common KPIs that influencer campaigns use? So um, we offer what is called full funnel influencer marketing. So we do programs that are awareness based, engagement based and conversion based. So the way that we track it is dependent on what our goal is. Um, but we're tracking things, um, you know, if we're looking at awareness based, so how many um, estimated impressions are we getting from how, from the times that the influencer mentioned the brand? How many times are they doing that? Um, but then also because we're using tracking codes, we're able to see you know through GA or Adobe um, how many new visitors did the influencer send, um, and how much time did those people spend on page? Did they convert? Did they not? Um, and really looking again, it it can span. It runs the gamut, right? Um, I'm happy to send out a list too that I have if that would be helpful. Um, to this group, I can post it on Facebook or whatever afterwards of kind of like, these are the common KPIs that we track based on where you're at in the funnel. Gotcha. Um, pivoting completely. So you work with niche experts and I assume that sometimes niche experts don't have that large of an audience. Um, you had on LinkedIn that the real life exam, the real life experience was your best, what was what you were optimizing for. How do you overall, um, before you actually use an influencer um, or add them to your network, determine whether or not they're worth building a relationship with um, for the client or for the campaign that you're about to run? So there, there can be people that are well known as experts um, in their industry that just don't have the social reach, right? So we do a lot of research to understand like how credible people are. Uh, before we start partnering with them. Uh, we do use a variety of tools. I mean, Google, obviously, but we use um, tools like Tracker um, and Analytica, which really allow us to dig deep into what are the things that they're publishing about? Do their values match with the brand? And when we are using niche experts, um, as well as brand individuals and all the other categories we talked about, by partnering them all together, you're adding credibility to all of them, right? So a brand individual might be super well-known, have incredible reach, but they aren't super, super uh, relevant on the topic. They can provide high level expertise, but by partnering them with the people who can like get in the weeds, dig deeper, get in the data, um, we're able to um, kind of create that credibility for all. Gotcha. Um, one of my favorite questions is just, what questions do you wish people would ask you? Maybe it's something that you wanna brag about that you don't wanna brag about or something that you, you wish everyone knew, but no one really knows about. Who? Um, I, I think that uh, even people at large brands feel like because I work for X enterprise brand, 
why wouldn't people want to partner with me? So I think there's a bit of arrogance in the industry sometimes that, um, again, if you're well known, um, especially in tech, that influencers will just be lining up to work with you. And I just don't think that's the case, right? I think like building, building that relationship is so important. Um, and there are influencers that I've been working with for five plus years that are now friends that I do happy hours with that when I see it at events, we go out to dinner, you know, so it, like that part is so critical. And I think um, it's not just like you turn it on, even if you pay people, they aren't going to be advocates long term. So again, I think pay influencers what they're worth, but don't assume just because you pay someone that you're going to get long term value out of it. Gotcha. So one of my follow up questions for that, that I actually had is, um, when someone is an influencer for a successful company and that company makes them maybe way more successful, are they hard to hold on to because they've kind of embodied that company's own success in themselves and they can branch off and do their own thing? And I don't want to answer the question. I'm just going to stop it there because I might answer it based on what you previously said. Um, well, the way we work, it's uh, like the brands don't own the influencer relationship. So obviously we want to find people that aren't talking about all of their competitors, but it really, we do try to find influencers that are a little more agnostic um, and brand agnostic and can, you know, can work for lots of different brands without it being an issue. And I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, but um, we don't do a ton of like um, product endorsement or, or things like that um, with our influencers, but we definitely um, are, you know, have helped some people move up the ranks within their organization um, by building thought leadership for them. And, and yeah, I mean, some companies say, you know, you can go do your thought leadership with other brands, others say you can't. And sometimes people do leave to go do that, pursue that full time. Um, it's, you know, it is sometimes what happens. Gotcha. But it sounds like if you, from your previous question, if you build a good relationship, even if they're successful and greatly more successful, they'll continue to like you. They're not going to leave you as an influencer to go do a completely different career. They're always going to be in that field. So their success will help them as they help you more and they'll be inclined to stay. Yep, exactly. Gotcha. Um, with about eight minutes left, one of my, so we have some wrap up questions. One of my favorite ones and it's story time is what's your best campaign that you ever ran that you thought it was going to fail and it succeeded or what's your campaign that you thought was going to be amazing and it completely failed? Um, so I have, I have a few for both. Um, the first one, so we had a more legacy uh, telecom, <clears throat> excuse me, telecom company that came to us a couple years ago that wanted to do um, an award, um, like a digital award. Um, and it was something we'd never done before. And, you know, we were including influencers as part of it, but we also needed to get people to nominate IT individuals um, that they felt were up and coming, that were doing amazing stuff in the space. It's a lot of very technical questions. Um, it was really tough, right? And we were like, we are going to, nobody's, nobody's going to take this survey. We, we aren't going to be able to pull this together, but we actually ended up, you know, then partnering with their sales team to unearth some people that they really wanted to nominate. Um, and then, you know, we got enough nominations that uh, we were able to get some really good content. We had influencers as judges for it. Um, and, you know, I think we had five influencers, only three promoted, um, and they didn't have large networks, but they were well known and trusted within the industry. Um, and so, you know, we did all this, put it all together, and then it sort of snowballed. So, um, there was actually a, I think it was like a, the mayor of a large city in Arizona actually presented uh, someone their award um, as part of this big hearing that they were, or not hearing, but meeting that they were having, um, generated millions of dollars worth of pipeline as part of this, because we were also trying to find people um, that fit their target profile, right, or their target audience. So it was, it was a very complicated, like four-phased program that I was, I, from the time we started, I, I was terrified we weren't going to be able to pull it off, um, but it ended up becoming huge. They've won awards for it. Um, and it was a really cool way to showcase people that might not usually get a light shined on them. And what was the fear behind that? Just that it was so complicated it wouldn't be able to pull it off? There were so many phases that it would die out of one of the phases? or It required a makes, lot of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, what makes something like that so complicated? It just, it required so many people to be successful. So the influencers as our judges required them to be knowledgeable. It required people to actually be nominated because I know sometimes when you're doing original research or an awards thing, especially if it's the first time you've done it, it's, you hear cricket sometimes. You're like, 
I've boosted a bunch of posts and, you know, sent this out to hundreds of people and five people have taken this survey. Right. Um, so I think there was just, it was so dependent on so many people to be successful um, that I was, I was really proud of our team and the way that they were all able to pull it together. <laughs> nice. Okay. Time to bite the bullet. What did, what failed that you thought was going to be awesome and why, and what can we learn from it? Um, so I used to, I used to head up our marketing for top rank. So now I'm on the client services side, but I actually used to be our director of marketing. And um, I spent months working on an influencer ebook, a lot of which I curated, um, expected it to be, you know, I unfortunately designed most of it myself, which I'm an amateur designer at best. Uh, that was before we had an awesome team that does that for us now. Um, but I'd, I'd invested months and months in this program. And yes, it was like our, it was labor dollars, right? So it wasn't actual um, dollars, but it, it fell kind of flat. Um, just didn't, didn't get anywhere close to what we get for clients in terms of, you know, downloads. I was trying to add people to a nurture that didn't go very well. Um, and the funny thing is when we first launched it, it was not successful, but then about a year afterwards is when I started noticing that more and more people were downloading it. So in the end, yes, it was successful. Um, but it's kind of one of those things that you put your blood, sweat, and tears into something over an extended period of time. And you expect to just like see those numbers roll in and they didn't. Um, so that was a lesson learned. Be a little more agile. <laughs> That's the lesson or what is the overall lesson? As you talk about, you're doing a industry report, you did an ebook, how are the two kind of separate and do any of the lessons that you learned from the book apply to the industry report that you would change up to make that more successful? Yeah, I mean, I think um, dropping um, things that are valuable and interesting to people before you even launch um, and also kind of testing your market to see what they respond to best. So I am someone who goes very theme heavy with the things that I do. I think it makes them more interesting, but it turns out it was a theme that was interesting to me um, and not necessarily interesting to the people I was trying to reach. So I think like acid testing, or even if you have clients or colleagues or people outside of your organization that do marketing, you're just saying like, hey, what do you think of this? Do you think it's interesting or is it dumb? Is it like just a weird thing that no one's into? <laughs> gotcha. So you leak what's going to be on your next season of master marketing what's going to be in your industry report before you've even gotten the speakers before you've even gotten the results and just kind of some of the questions of what's going to be in your ebook so that by the time it comes out everybody wants a copy right and you know which things to highlight right like which things are going to be most interesting to the people you're trying to connect with that's a great insight with just two minutes left two final questions i know that you already went over one of them so i'm just going to throw both of them out there one, okay. where's the best place that people can ask you more questions, reach out to you, get a relationship with you, if you become an influencer, possibly use you. Um, and two, uh, where do you, words, see, this was the messing up on camera. Where do you go to stay ahead of the wave, whether it's um, vlogs or videos or articles or a certain website, where can people, where do you go to learn more about influencer marketing than everybody else? Uh, so that other people could possibly read the same things and uh, become your level. Um, so number one, feel free to email me any questions. Uh, this is the stuff I nerd out on all day. Uh, my email is azekman at toprankmarketing.com. Um, and in terms of where I go, um, two industry experts that we work with quite a bit. Um, number one, Ann Hanley, smart, smartest lady I know. Um, her newsletter is fantastic if you're looking for things that are just scannable. Um, and it's also very, it's very welcoming and cozy to read. I love it. Um, she also um, has a blog, um, Marketing Crofts um, is a company she co-founded. Um, so for like all things marketing, I think Anne, especially as it relates to content. And if I'm looking for data insights, Chris Penn is always the person that I go to. Um, he goes so deep on so many topics. Most of the time it's over my head. Um, but I think, you know, um, they're, they're kind of two opposites for me. Um, with two different areas of expertise. Both have great newsletters. Um, and then, of course, our blog, toprankblog.com. Top uh, we publish five days a week on everything marketing. So wouldn't, wouldn't work there if I couldn't plug it. Exactly. Awesome. Ashley, thank you for all of your anecdotes, your stories about LinkedIn, your insights on how people can run this any size company from just getting started to a really big company. Masters Marketing attendees, thank you for coming. Thanks for asking all your great questions. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Bye.